Today I'd like to talk about a very nice study in the journal Curious titled Improvement of Recalcitrant Dissecting Cellulitis of the Scalp After a Trial of Upadacitinib, the JAK1 inhibitor of upadacitinib. I really like this study. You know, as we think about dissecting cellulitis, we think about treatments with isotretinoin to help with follicular keratinization, sometimes antibiotics, and JAK inhibitors are coming on the list as potential options. And this study in Curious showed a very nice improvement in the scalp of a patient with dissecting cellulitis. Now, dissecting cellulitis is a scarring alopecia, often affects males in their late teens, 20s, 30s. It can be very debilitating with the inflammatory reactions, the pus, the serosanguinous discharge, the odor. And it can be a very challenging condition, and it can be extremely debilitating. Now, the traditional options, as I mentioned, are isotretinoin, antibiotics. These help some patients, but they don't help everyone. And so what's so important in dissecting cellulitis is to know what's in your toolbox and to guide patients through the first-line and second-line options. And there's limited information about JAK inhibitors in dissecting cellulitis. And right now, JAK inhibitors are third-line options in my practice. I start with isotretinoin, plus or minus various antibiotics. Of course, some antibiotics can't be used with isotretinoin. You cannot use doxycycline with isotretinoin. There's good data suggesting that if that fails, you can consider TNF inhibitors like adalimumab. Short courses of prednisone are always on the list, but you know, short courses of prednisone aren't, aren't always all that effective in the long term. And then we have this third line list where we think about JAK inhibitors. We think about IL-17 and IL-23 inhibitors. We think about other options that affect uh, this, this type of inflammation like Dapsone. And so the purpose of this study was to evaluate the role of upadacitinib in a patient with persistent dissecting cellulitis that wasn't responding to conventional treatments. 26-year-old male had a background of obesity and atopic dermatitis, and he experienced painful lesions in his scalp. He had dissecting cellulitis, but no evidence of hidradenitis separativa. About a quarter of patients with dissecting cellulitis will have some other evidence of follicular occlusion, even up to a third. That includes hidradenitis separativa, pilonidal cysts. He had elevated CRP, elevated ESR, as ESR was 60, and he had elevated um, IL-6 levels. And despite using topical antimicrobials and corticosteroids, he had no improvement. He had used topical benzoyl peroxide. He had used oral antibiotics with sulfamethoxazole, trimethoprim. He had used prednisone, 20 milligrams, three times a day. He had used intralesional steroid injections. But despite these treatments, he really wasn't getting better. What I liked about this report in Curious is they went through a very nice, logical, systematic approach to the management of challenging dissecting cellulitis. And so when a person doesn't respond to you know, steroid injections and doesn't respond to first-line options, you know, you could, you could jump to upadacitinib, but it's probably not the most logical based on evidence. And so these authors nicely pointed out that they considered adalimumab, but it wasn't covered for, by insurance, and it was prohibitive based on the expense, and taking isotretinoin wasn't an option for this particular patient, and undergoing surgery to, um, you know, descalp the scalp or open up these sinus tracts wasn't an option for this patient. And so all the first line and second line options have been exhausted. And then we go on to the second line, the third line options. When you've asked, have I used isotretinoin and, or antibiotics? 
or have I considered them? Then you move on to the second line options. Have I considered surgery? Have I considered TNF inhibitors? And if the answer is yes, we've considered them, they're not approved, then we move on to third line options. And that's where we meet upadacitinib. And the patient was started on upadacitinib, 15 milligrams, twice daily. And he continued his topical antimicrobials and his oral antibiotics and his steroid injections. And at a one-month follow-up visit, he had a significant improvement in his pain, pustules, and his bleeding. And as the patient pointed out, this was the longest period where he had minimal to no flares, and it had a dramatic improvement on his quality of life. And around the two-month follow-up visit, examination showed less pustules, smaller sinus tracts, decreased inflammation, no major side effects on upadacitinib, and the pictures are quite remarkable. And this study is free online and curious. Take a look at these wonderful pictures. Initially, before upadacitinib, of these boggy areas filled with inflammation on the posterior scalp. And then within two months, a dramatic flattening of these areas with hair growth in these areas as well. And what you can't see in pictures is the improvement in quality of life. This man feels much better about his day-to-day. -day. He wakes up with a different attitude when you have dramatic changes in the scalp like this. I think this is, of course, what it's all about. So a really nice report in Curious about the potential of upadacitinib to sit on the list as valid therapeutic options for dissecting cellulitis. Maybe not yet first-line options. Debatable about where you put it as a second-line option, but it's on the list. And I think this study calls for further studies on the role of JAK inhibitors in dissecting cellulitis and where this fits in. But a very nice study. I think JAK inhibitors are very much on the list as third-line options in refractory dissecting cellulitis. Generally speaking, I still start with isotretinoin and, and antibiotics and uh, consider TNF inhibitors, but... Uh, Pretty convincing data emerging that we should be thinking about JAK inhibitors if all else seems to fail. And we need more research in this particular area. I congratulate the authors for this very nice case report. Studies like this give us convincing data as well as hope that uh, we really can help patients with challenging, challenging conditions. We're back next week with our final study of 2024 looking at alopecia areata and cardiovascular comorbidities. We'll look at a very nice study in JAD International by Kristen Losico, and I look forward to reviewing this study with you. A lot of controversy about whether alopecia areata is associated with cardiovascular risk or not, and this study provides us with some important framework to think about this important topic. And don't forget, on December 30th, we're meeting for a wonderful annual event, the top 20 of 2024. Each year I review some of the top hair research from the year gone by. This has been a tradition for a number of years now. And I hope you'll join me on December the 30th at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This will be recorded and posted at a later date, but we'll be celebrating the top studies of 2024. You can sign up on the Donovan Medical website for the Zoom webinar. And if you have any questions, just reach out to our office. But I look forward to seeing you at that wonderful event. And I look forward to seeing you next week for this wonderful study in JAD International, Alopecia Areata and Cardiovascular Comorbidities. Thank you so much for joining me for today's podcast. It's my belief that education and educational endeavors like this podcast can help clinicians acquire new knowledge, which can ultimately help patients. And education can also help hair loss researchers to ask better research questions. And better research questions can give clear answers about how to best diagnose or how to best treat hair loss. And ultimately, this will see benefit in our patients with hair loss. And education can also empower patients to acquire new knowledge so that they can engage in critical discussions with their hair loss practitioners, which hopefully will lead to improved care. 
At the Academy, we're really proud to be able to offer educational programs for clinicians, as well as educational programs for the public. And if you're a practitioner interested in studying hair loss at an advanced level, you might consider applying to the Evidence-Based Hair Fellowship, or EBHF. This is an intense program, but it's a program that equips you with the necessary skills to really help patients. Our next iteration starts January 2026, and we'd love to have you in the program. You can learn more about the EBHF by contacting our administrators at info at donovanhairacademy.com. That's it for this week. I look forward to seeing you next week for another episode of the Evidence-Based Hair Podcast. Thanks so much.